questions immediately. Uh, there are a couple guys with mics. Uh, please introduce yourselves and who you work for before you ask your question, just so we can keep track of things. Please. Uh, Kim Anderson, ITUIT.com, and freelance journalist from the UK. Uh, great keynote, thank you very much, and congratulations. Um, if, a, if a virtual uh, GPU in the private or public uh, cloud really takes off, as it likely will do, what are the implications for uh, local, powerful GPUs, um, and how do you see the future of, of those in that scenario playing out? Well, as in, as in uh, most of these type of computing environments where, where you can have enterprise level, cloud level resources, you know, people, there, there are still power users that, that require so much performance. And because their work requires them to have uh, dedicated computing capabilities, you know, I, I, have, I have every confidence that they're going to continue to want the best, the most, and the soonest. And they, they, it's not likely they'll want to share. And so when, you know, when you're designing a car um, and you're sitting at your desk, the idea of sharing your computer with someone else is a completely ridiculous idea. And the reason for that is because time is money. You've got to get that car designed. However, if um, uh, once that car is, is designed and they would like to share that and show that work to a client or bring it out to an ad agency so that the ad agency could create a, a great commercial around it, in that particular case, it makes perfectly good sense to access that same database that's actually in the cloud. Over here on the right, <coughs> Rob Barber. Yes. Rob Barber Freelance. Um, stellar and concept capability and deployment. So I love the gaming and the interactive aspects. How about going the other way? I didn't hear you hear about that. So for augmented reality, images, uh, video streams from the camera to the cloud so that you can actually do recognition and really enhance the immersive experience. Well, you know, the ability to have, have a supercomputer in the cloud, the ability to have a supercomputer in the cloud that could recognize images, understand the context of the environment, um, working with all of the sensor that you have in your mobile device and doing, providing the information back to that mobile device is exactly the same thing as putting a supercomputer in that mobile device. And so I, I think this is, a, this is an area that is going to, going to be quite be full of fruit of, of exciting opportunities. And, and I'm hoping that, that Bill invents most of them. <laughs> <laughs> yes, back there. Ryan Schramm, PC Perspective. There's one of the slides you talked about the Gaikai Power by G4 Grid. You had uh, decreases in latency on the game pipeline, capture, encode, and decode. What is it in the GPUs that are allowing you to make those adjustments and changes? Um, a couple of things. One, <clears throat> whereas, hey, whereas um, most consoles are now some six, seven years old, when a new game comes out, it pushes that console right to the limit. There, there are no, there's no horsepower left. And so as a result, the visual quality and the performance is balanced so delicately that it gets you just enough frame rate, but with the most visual realism that can possibly squeeze in there so that the game looks as fresh as possible. However, that same game running on our state-of-the-art Kepler could run 60 hertz easily. And so the frame time goes from you know, 30, 60 milliseconds down to 16 milliseconds. So you just, and just to put it in perspective, um, the pain time of the server is only five milliseconds away. And I think this is right, Bill, the speed of light around the earth is about 100 milliseconds or so, 10 to the second. Does that sound about right? Okay. And so 100 milliseconds is the speed of light around the earth. And so we're going to take essentially something that would have 60 some odd 100 milliseconds, and suppose we were to reduce it down to call it 33. We've taken six tenths of the speed of light of slack out of the out of, out of, out of the um, out of the latency. So so frame rate is one. The second thing is, whereas we used to render into a frame buffer, that frame buffer is then copied back into the CPU for encoding and, and compression and streaming. Our GPU now renders, and when, it, when it's done rendering, it's already streaming right out of the GPU. So again, we save a whole bunch of encoding time, not to mention copy time. And so between rendering things faster, <coughs> compressing and streaming in parallel, we've taken a couple hundred, two, three hundred millisecond 
lag and reduce it down to something that is effectively the same performance and the same snappiness as that of a new console. Over on the right, please. Yeah. Gil Russell, Bright Side of the News. It's a two part question, actually, and it's uh, to Bill. Um, there's uh, several aspects of uh, in the financial section of uh, doing the gaming and uh, you're removing, the, of course, the hardware uh, aspect and instant delivery. Have you, uh, can you illuminate uh, uh, how that goes <coughs> down? Uh, because it's always going to be an economic forcing issue on how the sale is made. Um, and the second part is Hollywood has always been uh, wanting to do uh, use assets in order to go into the game business, yet they proved to be completely inept. Could you expand on that? I think the first question first. Um, the first generation of cloud gaming that you have out there right now, they pretty much take a one to one ratio of one computer, one graphics card, one user, uh, which is pretty expensive to deliver. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that. But the, the new Kepler architecture is much more power efficient. So we can actually render a game in half the power. And it also has its own built in encoder so you can offload. CPU from encoding, so you can run many more games per server. Uh, so we're able to go from what is effectively one uh, game per server up to as many as eight games per server uh, now, and it reduces the cost by about that much and reduces the power by uh, about half. So what you're able to do now is to get economics that are close to movie stream. Uh, so you can get these models that are very similar to Netflix, uh, where you can just enjoy games. Uh, uh, really for $10 a month perhaps in the future would be now possible with what uh, GeForce Grid has to offer. Next question, Nathan? Go Nathan? Nathan? Yeah, can I get a mic? <coughs> oh. Sorry. When did you ever need a mic? <laughs> <laughs> it's a big room. Nathan Berkwood inside of 64. I'm still a little fuzzy on who is going to own the resources that deliver the the, the uh, various services and GeForce Grid. Is that something that NVIDIA is going to be involved with, or is it partners? Uh, where does, how does that actually get implemented? You're going to see it in a couple of different places. Um, sometimes you're going to see it uh, provided by the service providers. Service providers being G Cluster, you know, Ubitus, um, Playcast, Gaikai, of course. Um, they that, they uh, host some of their own servers. Sometimes you're going to see them in telcos. And the telcos, of course, already have a channel to your home. And instead of, instead of ABC and CBS, now there'll be uh, potentially a channel that, that says GeForce Grid, let's say, and, um, and has a whole bunch of games inside. In that particular case, uh, it will be hosted by the telco. So those are two, a service provider, or sometimes the NSO telco. But what I didn't hear is <clears throat> NVIDIA is going to be providing any of those services directly. That's right. We're not, we're not expecting. We're not currently planning on hosting the services ourselves. Um, but if it makes sense, then, you know, we're not against it. So you're just lending the GeForce brand to the concept, but it'll be delivered by partners. Um, the the processors and the software stack on top is called GeForce Grid, and when you put them into the, the service, it's called GeForce Grid. That's just the name of name of the technology. And so everybody who who licenses our software technology buys the graphics card, the specially configured graphics card for, for cloud gaming. Um, they license and they, they are powered by the GeForce grid. And a second question, is there anything that NVIDIA is planning to do to try and forestall that collision between Andromeda and the Milky Way? <laughs> <laughs> But uh, since I discovered this, this uh, vital piece of information uh, just a couple of days ago, and I was able to see the simulations in real time, girl, I don't know about you, but I'm making plans. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the gentleman in front. Brad Holt, Science Research. Um, have you figured out whether uh, at, let's say, half the speed of light, you have time to get out of here? <laughs> oh, come on now. You ask me a question. Um, Hey, ask Bill some questions. He has smart uh, Ask the same person I ask questions to. <laughs> Have you published pricing on the uh, K10 and the K20? And uh, separately, if I look at, uh, let's say, professional graphics in a, a 
design firm uh, and running the back office graphics versus putting the appropriate uh, into graphics on individual workstations. Uh, what does that price equation look like? Are we on, on par? Is it cheaper to go in the back room? Uh, can you give us some sort of scaling? Well, Jeff, why don't you take that? Yeah, so you, I, you guys take all the hard questions. All right, so I can, I'll, take, I'll take the second part because I can test the first thing. Um, but uh, I, I think, as Jensen described earlier, we sort of expect that um, the, the, the mode of digital design is not going to change dramatically. Um, the amount of local resource that a designer is going to require happens in bursts, it's very bursty. Um, so I think you, perhaps we can view those cloud resources, not just delivering desktops, but also providing burst capability of those, those desktops. Um, I did want to mention on the local side, we have an initiative called Maximus that I know you're particularly aware of, which is actually putting more compute power within the local workstation to allow designers to not only do their digital content creation, but local simulation. That might be called uh, local simulation. You may go optimize out on cloud where there's more resources, or you may put together cloud clusters, which you guys have covered. Uh, or sorry, carbon clusters, which you guys have covered in detail. So uh, I think the economics are going to really depend on the kind of workflow there is. Uh, no, nobody is saying that VDI is less expensive. They're saying the convenience factor and the total cost of ownership is, is far better. I don't think anybody is really in the delusion that it's going to be cheaper to deploy an individual engineer's resource because of the cloud. I think the convenience factor, the mobility, the collaboration are really the things that are going to ultimately result in more productivity. Which are going to drop the cost down and the time and money down. And the price, down, the price points. Um, we haven't announced price points yet um, on the VGX board themselves. Those bills are coming. Thank you. The middle over here. Nico, I'm Phil Golden. The kind of question on the case point here is in the materials you sent out to the press before, you mentioned the number of seven billion tracks for that K20. At AKA the GK110, or is it the two GK104s on the K10? The um, K20 is 7.1 billion transistors. Uh, uh, I looked it up last night. It is, it is uh, officially the um, most complex IC uh, commercially available on the planet. And uh, the next largest is a 28-nanometer uh, FPGA from Xilinx. Uh, in uh, 6.8 billion transistor, <coughs> and the uh, the next one larger, the next after that is a whole bunch of GPUs. But uh, from a CPU, the next one, the next largest is a 2.8 billion transistor Westmere, Westmere CPU from Intel. And so it kind of puts in perspective uh, the the, uh, the uh, K20, what you call GK110, um, the code code name for it. Uh, for the K10, you have a dual. Uh, three point something billion transistor uh, GPU, and so in aggregate, it's about six point six point something, almost the same size. Way more. Thank you. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Good for you, gentlemen over there. Uh, it's it's cool when you guys know our stats better than we do. Hi, uh, Dave Rujo from Beemo Capital Markets. I have a follow up question on the cloud with the um, cloud gaming and the EDI. I think it's very impressive uh, technology, but I'm just wondering uh, if the cloud is more power conscious and the GPUs is like in the 250, 300 watt PDP range. What's the usage model like how you can put the GPU to the server and bomb and the bomb that you have shown? That's the magic. That's the beautiful thing about it, and that's, I'm going to let these guys explain that. <laughs> uh, no, as I mentioned earlier, the, the Kepler architecture runs at about half the power of uh, Fermi and, and the other ones, so that helps a lot. Uh, also, with the virtual GPU, um, you can, of course, divide the power down even further. Uh, and then when you get multiple games in one server, you also average the power from the whole server, the rest of the items like the CPU, uh, disk drive, fans, etc. So your average power per game stream uh, is going to come down in half. Uh, that makes it uh, very much easier to operate a data center. I think from a VDI perspective, that amortization of the server infrastructure is even greater when you consider the amount of storage, local storage, local RAM, that's typically required of enterprise users. So that amortization rate gets you an even, even greater benefit. The other point is that we've been able to leverage the Tesla supercomputer architecture that uh, we've been working on. So we've been working with uh, server makers to make servers that accommodate GPUs. 
uh, for power and cooling. So it really is that supercomputer that you're getting in your, your game console now. We're leveraging a lot of that uh, design that we've done for Tesla uh, directly into GeForce Grid. And, and Bill, I think if you could help illuminate the uh, the efficiency, the energy efficiency comparison between using a CPU, a multi-core CPU, to do computer graphics versus a GPU acceleration to do computer graphics. Maybe approach it from that perspective. Yeah, well, if you look at the state of the art CPUs today, they're around two nanosoles per instruction. And on a CUDA core, we're doing the exact same instruction. Um, on Kepler, which is actually close to three times as efficient as, as Fermi, um, it's closer to 100 picocool. So it's a uh, you know, factor of roughly 20 to 1 um, in, in raw efficiency. So if you can do more things on the GPU, um, you wind up just you know, leveraging what is a scarce resource in a data center, which is power. And you know, what's very exciting to me is today it's you know, for games, for graphic professional designers, I think as things evolve forward, because of that tremendous compelling argument of power efficiency, more and more data center applications are going to move over to the GPU. I believe there was a question in the back there. Hi there, uh, Sean Hollister with The Verge. I wanted to find out, um, you've got the frames for GeForce Grid streamed right out of the GPU. When they get to the client end, what do you need to decode them within the TV, the tablet, the phone, etc.? A, um, uh, a pretty normal H.264 decoder from uh, just about any mobile device. You know, H.264 MPEG-4 has become quite the universal video standard. And so anything that you could use to decode YouTube, and just about every device in the world can decode YouTube, you should be able to decode GeForce Grid. Now, of course, the faster your decoder, decoder is, um, the, the, late, the smaller the latency even becomes. And so there's, there's some 10, 20, 30 milliseconds uh, for you to still take off even on a client device. So, so uh, it, it is possible to build a better client uh, to receive GeForce Grid, but almost every single device will do a pretty decent job. Cable set-top box, iPhones, any Android device, PC, Mac, uh, just buy it. Is that a better client being built and are you involved in it? Well, Tegra 3 is a pretty, pretty darn good client. And, um, and we try to make sure that, that all of our Tegra processors are pretty fantastic clients. And, and lastly, I'll hand this on right now, but um, is there any kind of limited exclusivity or exclusivity with Gaikai for the streaming service, or could another company build a streaming game service around GeForce Grid immediately? Yeah, so today today we uh, demonstrated Gaikai. They, they're doing fantastic work and they're seeing a great, great deal of success around the world. Um, from consumer electronics companies to telcos to uh, people who are trying to sell games on their websites like Walmart. And so they're, they're seeing quite a bit of success and I think this is a company to keep an eye on. On the other hand, uh, it, this, is a, this is an idea that is really sweeping uh, the game industry. You know, I mentioned a few other partners that we're highlighting here. Uh, G Cluster, Playcast, Old Toy, um, you know, Ubitus. These are companies uh, in Southern California, in Taiwan, in Korea, in Israel. I mean, there's there are companies everywhere working on this. And the reason for that is because once you once you make this technology um, a cloud streaming technology, you've made it so ubiquitous. Uh, you could really host and serve uh, video games from from just about any any place on the planet. Is there a question over there? Follow up here. Gil Russell, for a second. Um, this is the non secondary of the market. Um, the small and medium enterprises are combined um, under $200,000 supercomputer. And, uh, and because under a million dollars, you have a lot of discretionary spending that can be done. And it's a little known, low covered fact of life that this is uh, one of the fastest growing ends of the industry. And I'd like uh, for somebody in Nvidia to help us understand how what's buried in the 10Q report um, actually is, is growing in this sector because it, it represents phenomenal growth, somewhat like deck and wind computer spread back in the early 
I'm afraid to touch touch anything that, that is analogous to death. <laughs> <laughs> so, 